ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪದ ಸಹಗಣ ಲಲಿತ ಶ್ರೀ ವಿಶಾಖಾನ್ವಿತ ಹೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕರು very happy and grateful to be here uh, amit stall of y'all today i'm going to be speaking on um the topic life apps if you're wondering what it is um our life is full of apps isn't it <laughs> literally everything we do is app based um but wish there was an app that could solve our problems that could help us deal with complications in life that could help us you know if you go through any difficulty any situation of life which is sticky just open an app and you get a solution so that's what we're going to be doing today i'm going to be sharing with you all some thoughts that will help you look at life um and the complications and the dif- difficulties and the funny things that happen in life uh in a very interesting way through the lenses of the ramayana and the mahabharat we learned something uh, very practical and useful in our lives okay so that's what we're going to be doing today so first let me introduce you all to um, a story from the mahabharat that will ha- that will set the mood for the whole discussion today uh during the mahabharat war or j- rather just before the mahabharat war um there was a meeting of all the kaurava army they got together all the generals of the army got together and they having a discussion and um while the discussion was on bhishma who was a commander of the army he looked at everyone there and he started doing an, an analysis of their strength and weaknesses and he started telling you know according to each one's capacity he started giving them ratings like a typical corporate appraisal system you know so he called someone as maharathi someone is calling him as rathi so he's giving different ratings maharathi means someone who can kill thousands of people you know like that so then uh, finally it came to the turn of karna and bhishma gave him the rating of ardharathi ardharathi means half a warrior he can't even kill one person properly you know karna was offended he was really upset he said what nonsense i am bigger than a maharathi how dare you call me ardharathi and bishma gave an explanation he said you have a curse uh, from your guru parashuram and according to the curse that parashuram gave karna uh, whenever he needed the knowledge the most he would forget it so bishma told him what's the point in you being very good in exhibition matches during the most important war of your life you are going to be useless so bishma said according to me you are ardharathi you know karna couldn't handle it you know that uh, that uh, allegation and that uh, statement was too much for karna to take instantly he took a vow that as long as bishma is alive i won't enter the war the war lasted for 18 days of which bishma was alive for 10 days and 10 days karna was chilling outside imagine you know krishna went to karna and told him
and if people give a lot of likes, they feel I've done the right thing, you know. And if they don't get so much likes, they feel maybe I should do something else, you know. So the way others' opinions influence us is so powerful that we often um, rate ourselves based on how others rate us. So this actually is an indicator of a very hollow self-image. Now, if someone calls you a donkey, does it make you a donkey? No. See? <laughs> Even a small child can say that. But unfortunately, we take it very seriously. If someone calls us a donkey ten times, we, sh we actually start looking for a tail behind us, you know. Maybe we are, you know. So the way others influence us is so powerful that it actually completely supersedes the way we look at ourselves. And that is an indicator of a hollow self-image. That is an indicator that somewhere down the line, we are not happy with who we are. And we're trying to be what others want us to be. So, um, this idea of likes and dislikes is very much connected with um, the way we look at life itself and the way we look at our own uh, identity. Acceptance of our identity is very important for our growth, survival, happiness, contribution. If we don't identify who we are, we don't identify what our strengths is, we're going to be miserable in life. There was an elephant that wanted to participate in the Olympic competition of all the animals in the jungle. And, uh, you know, so this, this elephant took part in a running race. And um, there were all the animals running, cheetah, deer, tiger, you know, rabbit, all of them were running. The elephant also ran. Obviously, after the race, who won? Naturally, the cheetah won, the fastest animal in the jungle. The elephant decided, next year I'm going to win anyhow. One full year, it went through jogging practices, weight loss programs. <laughs> it really did its best. And next year, it participated again in the running race. Guess who won? Cheetah. Obviously, Cheetah won. Yeah. The elephant went into a depression. Permanently went into a depression, thinking it is useless. If only the elephant participated in a weightlifting competition <laughs> or a wrestling competition, there was nobody else could have won. But somehow the elephant wanted to win running race only, you know. So the nature of the human being is to think of one's weakness and try to make that into a strength. Because we are constantly in the mood of comparing with other people. Rather than accepting our realities the way it is, we start comparing our realities with somebody else's realities. And that's when it becomes painful. So, um, most of the times our expectations and realities are very different. Our expectations are this high, but the realities are here. There's a big gap between expectation and realities. The bigger the gap between expectation and realities, the more miserable you are. The more aligned your expectation is with the realities of life, the more peaceful you are. Unfortunately today, the way the media works, it makes our expectations very unnatural. You look at the advertisements and movies, you'll never find imperfect people there. Almost always perfect. But you look at yourself in the mirror, far from perfection, you know. You don't find too much perfection around, isn't it? So when you look at the movies and look at the uh, ads and you start living in a world filled with expectations that this is what life is. But life is something else in reality. That gap between expectation and reality makes you miserable. You watch an advertisement of some fairness cream and you know, I know so many young girls who are so inspired looking at that advertisement and they put kilos and kilos of fairness cream. Nothing much happens. You know. And then there are boys who look at, uh, you know, in India there's one very famous ad of an underwear. <laughs> one guy jumps from top of the building, you know, to save one girl, you know, just wearing his underwear. <laughs> and when you look at those ads, you feel inspired. And, and young boys buy these underwears and they think that they can really become macho and all that. Nothing much happens after you wear those underwears. 
our expectation is here but the reality is here the bigger the gap between expectation and reality the more there is stress that's the biggest cause of stress today so um, we have to learn to start aligning our expectation to the realities of life and that's what the scriptures teach us and that's what um, the the real uh, understanding of life is supposed to be there are four ways to look at life the first way is known as win lose way that's what the world teaches us that means for me to win you have to lose so the, there's a constant strife for um winning over others and in the process of winning this is called the spardhatmak jivan or a life of competition and the life of competition uh, pushes you towards stepping on other people's head and going ahead in life and most of us are that's that, you know, that's what we have learned right especially if you have passed out from the indian education system it it's geared towards that step on others walk ahead you know and at some point after doing this for a long period of time people get people get fed up and they say enough is enough you know then they get into the second mindset which is known as a lose win mindset lose win mindset means i don't want to win you go ahead you know and a lot of people step back from this competitive mindset and get into this whole lose win mindset means it's like a mindset of sacrifice you know they said forget it you know i don't want to win i'll step back you go ahead in life this feels good in the beginning because you feel you know that you are doing something good doing something positive but if it is not done in the right mood at some point you start feeling like a doormat everybody is stepping on you and going ahead in life what about me so people who don't have a healthy self image when they actually keep sacrificing for the sake of others they feel used they feel others are using me to go ahead in life and i i'm just where i am you know such people get into a very vicious thought process which is a third mindset which is known as lose lose mindset which means if i'm going to lose i'm not going to lose alone i'll drag you along with me you know this is called the crab mentality um you know when they transport crabs from one place to another there's a very interesting thing that you can psychology of crabs they don't cover the lid of the basket in which crabs are kept there are hundreds of crabs inside that basket there is no lid and these crabs are all alive you know if they choose they can all walk out and they can go back into the water but the crab mentality is so powerful when one crab tries to go up all other crabs pull him down as a result no crab ever gets out of the basket <laughs> imagine if all of them get together and uh, discuss and say hey, come on let's all get out you know doesn't work when one crab tries to go up all others pull him down that's the lose lose mindset if one person is going down or trying to go up rather everybody else is trying to pull him down the college is filled with that mindset isn't it you know i know so many students who um as soon as it becomes night they switch off their lights so that everybody else feels they are sleeping and then they turn on a light very small light and study <laughs> this is a lose lose my said <laughs> this one guy who was studying uh, in medical college and uh, um every every year he stood second in his class and one guy used to always stand first this fellow said come on why is this fellow standing first all the time one exam when this pers- for a person who stood first went to the toilet this fellow locked him from outside he went and answered the exam he came first <laughs> at what cost isn't it this is a lose lose mindset and um, the lose lose mindset leads to what is known as a downward spiral It's everyone just goes lower and lower and lower the fourth mindset which is a very healthy mindset is known as a win win mindset for me to win you don't have to lose and for you to win i don't have to lose we can win together and go ahead in life but to get to this mindset it requires a lot of maturity and it requires a very healthy self image and such healthy self image uh stems out of a sense of security a sense of love and belonging so when we feel good about ourselves and when we feel 
you know happy about ourselves we we can get into this win win mindset um to reach this win win mindset we should know what it means to be happy in life and to know what it means to be happy in life i'm going to tell you all what it means to be unhappy in life and i'm going to tell you two secrets of how to be unhappy in life you do what i'm telling you and you will surely be unhappy sure shot formula to be unhappy in life <laughs> so the first way to be unhappy in life is try to make everybody happy <laughs> if you try to make everybody happy there will be one person who is unhappy and that is you Jesus Christ and Krishna have not managed to make everybody happy. <laughs> Where is the question of you and me trying to make everybody happy? It's impossible to make everybody happy, isn't it? And the second way to be unhappy in life is try to make everybody happy with you. I'll I'll I'll, I'll explain what this means. There was a young boy many many years back. You know this fellow. Uh, he made his first YouTube video. and he showed it to me i said wonderful and uh, that video had about 99 likes and one dislike so this fellow is crying very very sad he was i said what happened he said why this person didn't like my video yeah. i said you didn't see 99 people liked the video he said that doesn't matter to me why this one fellow didn't like <laughs> he was after that one guy who didn't like his video so he wanted to know why he didn't like his video This is the problem when you try to make everybody happy with you. If 99 people are happy with you, and one person is not happy, you will be unhappy. Because you are trying to get all hundred people happy with you. <laughs> We have to learn to be happy with ourselves, immaterial whether others are happy with us or no. This is not about being shameless. This is about being self-sufficient. Um, the nature of this world is that. Um, at some point of time or the other somebody is going to be unhappy with us that's the nature of this world you know but we have to learn to internally be happy with what we are doing you know and happiness doesn't come by the externals a lot of people think that if i'm dressed very well if i have a good hair style if i talk very nicely then you know uh, people will be happy with me and i'll be happy but the reality is that the substance that we have inside us is more important than the externals and a true sense of happiness comes when you have really contributed sufficiently when you have really done something powerful something amazing something which is a deep contribution to society actually people don't care how you look after that if you look at some of the most powerful influential people in the world they are not the most handsome people to look at Mahatma Gandhi, you know, Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela. You look at some of the most in powerful influencers in the world. You and look at them; they are not really handsome to look at. They are not beautiful to look at. But who cares? Because people are focusing on you know what they have done, isn't it? So as long as you don't do anything, people will keep looking at you. But the moment you do something, people will look at what you are doing rather than looking at you. The focus shifts on what your contribution is. rather than your, your externals um perfume bottles are the most beautiful bottles to look at isn't it they look really good just because they look so good you can't drink the perfume inside it you will die so sometimes externally things may look good but internally it may be poison and sometimes externally things may not be so great but internally the focus because it is on contribution and something very powerful people don't care the or the externals the idea of um externals shifts a lot according to the mindset so i'm going to be telling you all something about um a very interesting idea from the mahabharat you know this is a very small story from the mahabharat but the story is very instructive because it talks to us about something known as self satisfaction so we just spoke about self image now we're going to be speaking about self satisfaction there was a person in the mahabharat who so 
So there's a person in the Mahabharat who loved shopping. <laughs> now, if you're wondering, you know, where shopping was, you know, Walmart's in Mahabharat times and, you know, Ikea and... <laughs> so this person, his name was Ashwatthama. So though shopping didn't exist, but the shopping mentality existed that time also. Yeah. And look at this. You know, when you study Ashwatthama's life, you actually understand a lot about our own mindset today. You know. Ashwatthama, he had a lot in his life. Right, right from the day he was born. He was born with a jewel on his head. And the power of the jewel was that anyone who had the jewel would never feel hungry, never feel thirsty, never get sick, never be defeated in any war and literally was immortal. So now if you have a jewel like that on your head, what else do you need? But somehow, he didn't believe in it. Every time he was attacked by somebody, he would go and hide behind his father, Dronacharya. So if you have a jewel like that and you know you are immortal, then why do you have to hide? But see, it's not about just having it. It's about being able to use what you have also. Isn't it? One day Ashwatthama saw his father, Dronacharya, giving the Brahmastra to Arjun. So Ashwatthama went to Dronacharya and he said, I also want the Brahmastra. Dronacharya said, come on, you don't deserve the Brahmastra. You are not qualified to have the Brahmastra. Ashwatthama said, no, I want it. I want it. Really pestered his father. The father got so fed up. He gave him the Brahmastra and he said, get, get out from here. You know. This guy takes the Brahmastra. And he goes to Dwarka to meet Lord Krishna. And he tells Krishna, I have an exchange offer for you. I'll give you my Brahmastra. You give me your Sudarshan Chakra. Krishna said, who is this guy? You know, my, my sons have not asked me. My best friends have not asked me. Where this fellow is coming and asking for Sudarshan Chakra? So Krishna said, I don't want your Brahmastra. You, you, keep, you take my uh, Sudarshan Chakra also. And Krishna released the Sudarshan Chakra. This guy tried to hold it. He, he fell unconscious. He couldn't, um, he couldn't hold the power of the, of the chakra. So when he got up later, Krishna asked him, Why do you want the chakra? Why did you ask me for it? He said, I wanted to use the citizen chakra to kill you. Imagine. So Ashwatthama like people, they are not happy with what they have. They somehow feel happiness lies in what they don't have. You get an iPhone 13. Somehow you feel happiness lies in iPhone 14. <coughs> that is yet to come. You, know. you get. Here. Huh? It's already here. It's <laughs> 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 See? <laughs> Latest updates. <laughs> so, what you have somehow doesn't seem to be satisfying you in every aspect of life. People are not happy with the relationships that they have. They just feel somehow this person who was in my life would be so happy. You know, People are not happy with the car that they have. Somehow they will, if I have this car, I'll be happy. They're not happy with the jobs that they have. Somehow if I have this particular position, I'll be happy. The nature of the mind is to keep you dissatisfied with what you have and looking for satisfaction in what you don't have. There was a king who was uh, celebrating his birthday. And this king decided to celebrate his birthday in a very unique way. He said, tomorrow morning, the first person I see, I'll make him happy. That's the way I'll celebrate my birthday. So next day morning, the king uh, got up and he happened to see a beggar on the street. So he called the beggar and gave this beggar a copper coin. This beggar became so happy, excited. First thing in the morning, he got a copper coin from the king. Jumping and dancing, he threw the coin in the air. But somehow in his excitement, he forgot to catch the coin. It fell rolled and fell into a wet flowing gutter. So this fellow went and put his hand in the gutter to find the coin. The king felt bad for him. He called him. He gave him another copper coin. This man again was so happy, put the copper coin in his pocket, again went to the gutter, you know, to put his hand. The king said, forget that coin, I just come here. He gave him a silver coin. He thought he was very poor, you know. So this beggar became thrilled. He put the silver coin in his pocket, again was going to the gutter. The king said, what's wrong with you? He called him, gave him a gold coin. This man was super excited. He put the gold coin in his pocket. Again was walking towards the gutter. Now king was getting fed up. You know. He said, what will you take to become happy? You know, Give him a bag of gold coins. This beggar said, no matter how much you give me, till the coin in the gutter comes out, I won't be happy. 
द नेचर ऑफ द माइंड इज टू फाइंड सम रीजन टू बी अनहैपी इन लाइफ द नेचर ऑफ द माइंड इज टू फाइंड सम रीजन टू बी डिसफाइड इन लाइफ एंड देफोर अ लॉट ऑफ पीपल दे थिंक दैट राइट नाउ द सिटुएशन आई एम हिन इज नॉट मेकिंग मी हैप्पी इफ आई जस्ट चेंज द सिटुएशन आई बी हैप्पी you know doing a 9 to 5 job for, uh, you know 5 days a week monday to friday is people are miserable the thing saturday and sunday if i have a full change i'll be so happy in life you know and how does they change they're not exactly happy isn't it so somehow and of course people change jobs all the time what people are looking for is not change they're looking for something known as transformation there's a big difference between change and transformation change is reversible and transformation is irreversible change is like uh, suppose a person decides from tomorrow i am going to stop smoking two days later again he starts smoking that's change um in india we have a place known as marine drive in mumbai um you go there on 2nd of january hundreds of people jogging there you go there on 2nd of february empty <laughs> that change you know new year resolution yes yes we'll do jogging and this and that last one month you know that's what change looks like but transformation is something different transformation means change that is irreversible a stone becoming a statue is a transformation the statue cannot become a stone again a, a caterpillar becoming a butterfly is a transformation the butterfly cannot become a caterpillar again Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi becoming Mahatma Gandhi is a transformation. Mahatma Gandhi can't become Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi again. You know, you tell Mahatma Gandhi to wear jeans. You think he's going to wear after after some time? Impossible. He is a changed, transformed person. So whenever we think that we are looking for change in life, we are actually not looking for change in life. What are we looking for? We are looking for transformation in life. So, tra- what is transformation? Transformation is an upgradation of yourself. So every time you think that this particular change will make me happy, <coughs> like Ashwatthama, he was constantly wanting something different, something, some change, thinking that this new thing will make me happy, this new situation will make me happy. That's not how happiness comes. What really makes you happy is when you grow from within. So there are two ways to live life. One is go through life. Now when you go through life, there are many changes that will come into your life. typically four bottles come in everybody's life there's a milk bottle there's a coke bottle there's a whiskey bottle and then there's a drips bottle <laughs> as you age these four bottles come into your life of course a third bottle can be avoided by many people you know so whether you want it or no these four bottles will come you will come across this is called go through life so just by going through life you will go through these changes but transformation is called grow through life grow through life means that it is not about it is something which is consciously done it will not happen on its own transformation you have to put an effort to go through life you don't have to put an effort it will happen automatically but for experiencing transformation you have to put an effort i know so many students who study very nicely while they are studying for their exams etc but after the exams and after they get their degrees they take a wow i will never touch a book in my life again <laughs> and they seriously lifelong never touch a book unfortunately people don't understand there's a big difference between information and transformation so the college and schools they give us a lot of information they give us a lot of knowledge but what we need in life is not knowledge we need wisdom and you cannot get wisdom just by living life normally you need to learn, read books you need to upgrade yourself you need to hear uh, wise things so that you upgrade uh, the way you look at life and that's what uh, is um, the idea of finding self satisfaction so now i'm going to talk to you all about another very interesting concept which is known as self control all of us we experience negativity in our lives isn't it at some point of time or the other we experience negativity we experience sadness 
we experience you know difficulties we experience challenges so how do you deal with these negativities the way we deal with these negativities determines uh, how we how we uh, live live our lives the quality of our lives negativity is a part of life you can't avoid it 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 will come whether you want it or not but our ability to deal with negativity is something that we have to learn um one man went to a psychiatrist and uh, he told this psychiatrist that um, i feel like committing suicide what should i do the psychiatrist told him i'll tell you what i do when i feel like committing suicide imagine one fellow drowning in a quick sand is trying to help somebody who is drowning in a quick sand today the statistics is that every third person goes to a psychiatrist which means every psychiatrist goes to another psychiatrist <laughs> <laughs> so so this guy he told this uh, so this psychiatrist told him i'll tell you what i do when i feel like you know committing suicide he said there's a circus close by in the circus is a clown when i watch the act of this clown i forget all my problems and this fellow told him i highly recommend you you also go to this circus and watch this clown perform and you will forget all your problems This man looked at him and he said, "Sir, I am that clown." <laughs> <laughs> so today's world, I call it as smiling faces, crying hearts. You ask everyone, "How are you?" Big smile on the face and say, "Everything is fine," you know. But you scratch the surface, there's an ocean of misery inside, and most people don't know how to deal with it. Most people don't know, and rather can't admit. that i need help unfortunately when we don't open up and when we don't seek help it is very difficult for us to deal with what we are experiencing in our lives there was a a, a village where they uh, you know erected a huge tent and uh, there was a massive advertisement that said uh, 25 paise circus a huge line first day first show you know 25 paise what do you get big line so the first fellow he paid 25 paise and went inside the tent empty tent literally no one there empty completely so um you know this guy was wondering what's happening empty tent i paid 25 paise so from inside that tent the other side of the tent one huge wrestler came out This fellow said, "Hey, start the circus. I paid twenty five paise." This wrestler came to him, gave him one tight slap, you know. This fellow said, "Why did you beat me?" He said, "What do you get in twenty five paise?" And he beat him black and blue. And this fellow came out of the tent, you know. And the second fellow was standing in the line. He asked him, "How was the circus?" This fellow said, "First class, <laughs> too good. Everyone must watch this circus at least once, you know." <laughs> The second fellow went in, got beaten up, and he came out. And he told the same thing to the third guy. Everyone in the village got beaten up badly, but no one had the guts to admit that we got beaten up there. <laughs> This is the nature of the world, you know. The nature of the world is that people are miserable, but they're not ready to admit that they're miserable. They want to like tell the world, "Yeah, I'm fine. Everything is good." You can't deal with negativity. unless you learn to see and accept that i am struggling unfortunately um to look at life situations even the most negative situations in a positive way it requires some courage it requires some guts but it is important for us to go ahead in life within the most negative situation of life there is a small streak of positivity always to find that streak of positivity sometimes we may not be able to do it we may need help but sometimes it is possible for us to do it ourselves just like um there was a guy who was going for an interview he just stepped out of his house and he was going for this interview and as soon as he stepped out of the house there was a crow that passed over and dropped mahabrasad and was like messed up his brand new suit was messed up you know 
and uh, this guy was walking with his friend and he said thank god the friend said come on your suit is messed up you are going for an interview why are you saying thank god he said thank god elephants don't fly <laughs> quantity would have been much bigger <laughs> so negativity happens problems happen in our lives we go through mess we go through difficulties is undoubtedly all of us will go through it at some point of time or the other but in the most difficult situation of life how do you look for a streak of positivity that's what intelligence is all about in uh, the vedic scriptures there is a word in the vedanta there is a word called vismay the word vismay means wonderment or it's you can call it the wow factor so when you see something beautiful you say wow isn't it you see a beautiful uh, scene you know you say wow so that wonderment and that wow is very important in life but unfortunately a lot of us we have become so inert we have become so inert that you see the most beautiful thing also you you become so inert that you don't enjoy it you don't experience it you don't uh, you know really appreciate it like many times i do these corporate events and uh, in these corporate events i'm giving uh, i'm giving lectures and sometimes i'm cracking jokes i'm cracking some hilarious jokes <laughs> but in front of me are a group of people no expression on their face <laughs> they don't smile they don't laugh they don't cry also absolutely no expression you know i call these masal dosa faces you know <laughs> abs blank now how do i know whether the guy is understanding or not understanding you know so some of human beings have become expert in hiding their feelings and not expressing their feelings It's showing it deep within themselves and acting as if nothing happened you know so this wow factor is very important in life so the other talks about vismay vismay means look at small things in life and be happy you know i remember in my younger days uh, we used to sit over a meal and we would talk and we would laugh about about many things we would enjoy and sometimes we would laugh so much they were literally rolling on the ground laughing you know nowadays laughing loudly is considered bad manners yeah. if you laugh loudly it's considered uh, you know not so um, sophisticated you know. so today's generation is a handkerchief generation you put your handkerchief and giggle a little bit the next generation is even worse you know if somebody wants to laugh loudly they'll say lol <laughs> <laughs> that's all and the next generation is even worse if they want to laugh loudly they'll send one big smiley you know <laughs> depending on the extent of the smile you understand you're laughing loudly or less so naturally because we are not expressing ourselves there is so much frustration inside there is so much of frustration inside you know people are like you are uh, rubbing yourself with the soap and the soap falls down you're shouting at the soap and abusing the soap you know you're calling up someone and the other guy doesn't pick up the phone you're shout yelling at the phone so there's so much of frustration inside because there is no expression outside the more you hold on inside it it will it will come out in different ways you know the expression will come out in different ways so laughter is a very important part of life and there should be an element of laughter in our lives so if you study many of the olden uh, stories there is such elements of funny things that add some laughter into our life right and these small funny uh things actually make life beautiful so um a lot of times are you going to come inside here a lot of times um the the mindset of a person helps in the way you look at issues and problems in life 
uh, there was a guy whose name was uh, uh, Percy Spencer. I don't know if you have ever heard his name. This guy, Percy Spencer, he, um, when he was born, he was about seven months of old, his father died. And uh, his mother couldn't raise him. So, so she gave Percy an adoption to her uncle and aunt. So the uncle and aunt were raising Percy. At some point, the uncle died when, when he was about seven years of age. And then Percy had to start working in a mill to, you know, uh, help his, the family. And when he was about 12 years onwards, he started working. And eventually he got a job in a radiation factory. Uh, it was um, a factory that was producing weapons, allied weapons. One day, this man, he walked into the factory and he was wearing a brand new lab coat. And he walked into the factory like a normal day. And after a little while in the factory, he started feeling wet on his, in his pants. He looked below, he had kept a chocolate bar in his pocket, which had melted and his whole pan got messed up. Now imagine if anybody else was in Percy's place, what they would have done? They would have said, what the hell? All the bad things in life are happening to me only. Isn't it? I mean, series of misfortunes happening in his life. And Percy could have seen this one more as like the last straw on the camel's back. But Percy, he, he did something very interesting. He analyzed the lab. He saw all the conditions, the temperature, he saw all the conditions that ideally should have made him the, the chocolate melt. But he couldn't find any reason why the chocolate should have melted. So Percy, he realized there must be something else because of which this chocolate melted. And Percy actually started pursuing why this chocolate melted. He spent two years pursuing this idea why the chocolate melted. And after two years, this man invented the microwave oven. Now, if the chocolate had melted and he had started cursing, he would never have invented the microwave oven, isn't it? The chocolate melted and he started thinking and he started questioning. And that's how he came up with this. There are two ways you can live your life. Either with what is known as a victim mindset or what is known as a victor mindset. The victim mindset means uh, it's an indication of focusing on what I have lost. And the victor mindset is an indication of focusing on what I can achieve. Yes, we will lose a lot in our lives. In the process of living our lives, we will end up losing a lot. But instead of focusing on what we have lost, if we start focusing on what we can gain and what we can achieve in that situation of loss, there is so much we can progress in our personal lives. And that's why uh, it is very important to start having discussions with ourselves. Um, there are two ways to live life, as I said, the victim mindset and the victor mindset. But what a victim mindset looks like, let me explain to you with the help of a graphic example. I'm sure all of you all have, you know, handled soda cans and Sprite cans, oh, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> Thank you for adding that fun. You want to come in? You can come and sit here. So, if you take a soda can and shake it like this, and then you open it up, what happens? Everything inside comes out, isn't it? If you take a bistlery can, a water bottle, and shake it and open up, what happens? Nothing comes out. Nothing comes out. So these are the two ways you can live life. When life shakes you up, one way is that you blast out. Everything inside you comes out, you know? <laughs> this is known as a reactive way of living life. And then the second way of living life is known as a responsive way of living life. The responsive way is a more responsible way of living life. The responsive way is where you start talking to yourself before you react, before you respond rather. The reactive way is you do and then you think what I did. The responsive way is I think and then I do. There was a lady who was um, in a mall and uh, you know she was, um, her daughter was crying like mad. Sometimes these children, when they cry, the it's almost like they have an amplifier fitted inside, you know. <laughs> Massive volumes. And this girl was crying and crying. The lady was looking at the girl and telling, Jennifer, relax. And the girl kept crying more and more and more. 
The lady looked at the girl. She said, "Jennifer, don't create a scene over here. Relax." And the girl was yelling and crying. And the lady said, "Jennifer, don't create any scene here. Just relax." There was an old man who was observing this, and he walked up to this lady and she said, "Ma'am, don't you think you're talking a language that is too adult-like? Why don't you talk a more child-friendly language?" This lady looked at this man and she told him, "What makes you think I'm talking to her? Jennifer is my name. I'm telling myself, <laughs> Jennifer, relax." <laughs> So many times we can't do anything about what others say or how others behave. It's not in our hands, but we can control what we say and how we behave. So next time you're standing in a line and somebody jumps the line and goes ahead, tell yourself, Jennifer, relax. You know. <laughs> next time you're waiting in a restaurant and you've ordered for a meal and that waiter just doesn't come, and finally he comes out and he uses the plate to somebody else. Tell yourself, Jennifer, relax. You know, there will be situations in our life where we feel like reacting, but those are the very situations in life where we have to learn to respond. And in that response lies your peace. In that response lies the uh, victor mindset. The victim mindset is controlled by others. Somebody presses a button, and you are laughing. Somebody presses another button and you're crying. So a lot of us give the remote control of our life to other people. A lot of us give the remote control of our life to to life situations. So the more we give the remote control of our life to other people and life situations, the more miserable we are. And the more we take charge of the remote control of our lives and actually decide how we want to respond, the more peaceful we are. And that mindset is so very important. For uh, for for being able to control ourselves and for being able to grow. Actually, when other people behave badly, they are not necessarily bad people. They just the situation in which it is, it makes them behave in a certain way. I I'll tell you a story from the Mahabharat that illustrates how other people are. The Mahabharat has this very beautiful story of uh, a man named Chitrasen. So Chitrasen was a Gandharva. From the heavenly planets, and once Arjun went to the heavens, and he saw the Chitrasen perform. So Chitrasen was an expert musician, expert singer, expert dancer, and Arjun, when he saw the performance of Chitrasen, he was impressed. So Chitra, uh, Arjun went to Chitrasen and expressed his appreciation of what uh, he heard. So Chitrasen was so touched by Arjun's appreciation. Chitrasen told Arjun, "I'll teach you everything I know." and chitrasen actually taught arjun dancing skills singing skills musical skills and they, and arjun he was so touched by what chitrasen did for him arjun told chitrasen i'll teach you everything i know about the art of war and arjun taught him you know the use of weapons and uh, war strategy everything they became the best of friends the same chitrasen once came to the earth planet and uh, he was having a picnic with his friends in a forest known as dwaipavan And while they were having a picnic in this forest, Duryodhan comes there with a group of his friends. He tells Chitrasen, "I want to have a picnic here. You go somewhere else." Chitrasen tells him, "I came here first. Why should I go somewhere else? You go somewhere else." Duryodhan says, "No, this forest belongs to me. You get out from here." Chitrasen says, "I won't get out." And they both begin to have a fight, massive fight. Eventually, in the fight, Duryodhan's entire army got defeated. They all ran away. And Chitrasen tied up Duryodhan and threw him on the ground. So now, if you analyze these two stories, is Chitrasen good or is Chitrasen bad? Chitrasen is neither good nor bad. It depends on how you deal with him. If you deal with him nicely, he is good. If you deal with him badly, he is bad. All of us are like Chitrasen, isn't it? We are neither good nor bad. Each and every person over here is. A mini Chitra Sen, basically, you know. If somebody deals with us nicely, the best of us comes out, and if somebody deals with us badly, the worst of us comes out. And so, good and bad exists in all of us. Interestingly, in the previous ages, like in Satya Yuga, demons and gods they lived in different planets. Narsingh Dev lived in a different planet. 
here in Nekashibu lived on a different planet. Now, Singh Dev came to this planet. In Treta Yuga, demons and gods lived in different countries in the same planet. Ravan lived in Lanka, Ram lived in Ayodhya, you know. Different countries but in the same planet. In, in Dwapar Yuga, demons and gods lived in the same family, in the same country, you know. Kauravas, Pandavas, same family, brothers. But one side very demonic and one side very, you know, good. In Kali Yuga, the age in which we are, Demon and gods live in the same person. I am only good, I am only bad. <laughs> you can find the worst person in me, you can find the best person in me. It simply depends on how you deal with me. And that is why it is important not to put people in boxes and tell that this person is bad or this person is good. Actually, nobody is good and bad. It simply depends on how you deal with people. If we want to make relationships work, we need to learn how to adjust. We need to learn how to deal with these idiosyncrasies and go ahead in life. Just like if there is a, if you are on a highway, you are driving fast on a highway and right in front of you, you see a truck coming towards you. What will you do? The truck is on the wrong side, you are on the right side. What will you do? You will adjust, isn't it? What if you're going ahead and a second truck comes? What will you do? Scream. Huh? Scream. Scream. Okay. Practically, you'll again adjust, isn't it? Yeah. If a third truck comes, what will you do? Again adjust. If the 20th truck comes, what will you do? Adjust. After 20 trucks, if so somebody says, now I am not going to adjust. <laughs> Let them adjust now, you know? And you will go straight and bang into the truck, you know, and lands up in the hospital. And somebody asks him, what happened? What's the point in saying, I was right, he was wrong, you know. When it comes to limitations of traffic on the road, the question is not whose mistake it is. The question is whose life it is. If you, if you value your life, you will adjust. Similarly, on the traffic of road of relationships, there is always some limitations. When there is a limitation in the traffic on the roads of relationships, the question that you ask yourself is not whose mistake it is. The question you ask yourself is whose life it is. If you really value the relationship, you learn to adjust. When I tell the story, many people ask me how many times to adjust and who should adjust? Why should I adjust? You know, the answer is very simple. I don't know how many of you have, you know, in your childhood you have seen this. Uh, you know, this pictures, the four pictures. The, the first picture is of two goats walking on a small wooden bridge. You know, they're walking together like this. The second picture, both the goats are fighting with each other. Third picture, both the goats fall into the river. And the fourth picture, one goat bends down and the other goat goes on top of it and this fellow also goes. The question is, which goat bends down? The goat that is more mature bends down. So in every relationship, you will find one person who is more mature and one person who is not so mature. If both decide, I will not be mature, then the relationship has no future. Both are going to fall into the ocean, onto the river, basically. And how long should a mature person bend? Maturity means that at some point, the other person understands that I also need to learn to adjust. I need to learn to deal with it. And uh, mature people are those who, rather than thinking whose mistake it is, they value the relationship. They value the relationship so much more that they are ready to learn to adjust to maturely, you know, uh, take uh, stances. And today is a world of uh, love at first sight and divorce at first fight. You know. <laughs> In such a world where there is no maturity at all and, you know, you take decisions so sporadically, it's very difficult to maintain relationships and therefore self-control is so very important for us to have meaningful and uh, deep relationships. I'm going to tell you all one last story and this story will tell, talk to you all about something known as self-growth. Whenever we want to achieve any success in life, whenever we want to achieve any kind of success in life, we need to understand that there are many factors behind our success. 
a lot of times we think that I am the maker of my own destiny and I only decide how uh, successful I become. While that has its place, there are many other factors that are beyond us that determines why we are successful in life. Uh, I'm going to tell you all a story from the Mahabharat that will help you understand what this means. So in the Mahabharat, just before the Mahabharat war, uh, rather just after the Mahabharat war, there's a discussion among the Pandavas, you know, they, they won the war. And the discussion is, who is the man of the series? Who is really the real hero of the war? So then, you know, sometimes, uh, some, some people are saying Arjun is the real hero. And some people are saying, actually, you know, uh, Bhim is the real hero. And they were confused, who is the real hero? And then they all decided, let's go and ask Barbarik. Barbarik actually watched the whole war. So the story of Barbarik is, before the Mahabharat war, there's this man named Barbarik who comes to join the Mahabharat war. So Krishna comes to know that this demon named Barbarik is coming to join the war. So Krishna went to Barbarik disguised as a Brahmana. So when uh, Krishna walked to, uh, uh, went and met Barbarik, uh, so he asked him, where are you going? Barbarik said, I'm going to join the Kurukshetra war. Krishna said, where is your army? He said, I don't need any army. I'm alone enough. So he said, where are your weapons? Barbarik removed three arrows. And he said, these are my weapons. Krishna said, are you gone mad? There are millions of soldiers over there. What do you do with three arrows? Barbarik said, these are not three ordinary arrows. These are powerful arrows given to me by Lord Shiva. And then Krishna said, what do you mean by powerful arrows? This fellow said, the first arrow I can use to mark all the people I want to kill. And the second arrow actually goes and kill, kills all of them. The third arrow, after I mark them, if I decide I don't want to kill someone, I use the third arrow to unmark them. <laughs> Something like Photoshop, you know. So Krishna said, what are you saying? Is that even true? Barbaric said, I'll show you, give you a demonstration. So they were standing under a tree while having this discussion. Barbaric said, I'll remove all the leaves from this tree and show you. So he used the first arrow, marked all the leaves of the tree. And the second arrow actually lifted all the leaves off the tree. And Krishna, he kept one leaf under his feet and hid it, just to test Barbaric. And the second arrow was hovering over the feet of Krishna. And Krishna picked, lifted his feet and he picked up the last leaf also. Krishna realized that this guy is something else. So Krishna asked him, whose side are you going to fight on? He said, I am going to fight on the weaker side. So Krishna realized, this fellow is really dangerous. Because right now the Pandavas are weak and Kauravas are strong. So in the beginning, Barbaric will be on the Pandavas side. After some time, if Kauravas become weak, he will switch sides. So Krishna said, this guy can't partic shouldn't participate. So Krishna, he asked him, you know, I need some charity. Can you give me some charity? So Barbaric said, yes, yes, you are a Brahmana. You ask me any charity, I'll give you. So Krishna said, please give me your head in charity. I want your head. So Barbaric was shocked. Who asks head like that? Na? So Barbaric said, you tell me who you are first. I know you can't be a, you know, an ordinary person. So Krishna revealed himself. And Barbaric told Krishna, because you have asked me, I'll give you my head. But I have one request. He said, I know you can do anything. You know, Barbaric recognized Krishna's divinity. He said, I know you can do anything. Just give me the boon that my head will see the entire war of Kurukshetra. I want to see the battle. So Krishna said, fine. He cut off the head of Barbarik, put the head on a stick and mounted that head on top of a mountain. He placed the head on top of a mountain. And from top of a mountain, Barbarik saw the whole war. So Barbarik was literally the only witness of the whole war live, you know. So after the war got over, when the Pandavas were confused who is the real hero of the war, they went to Barbarik. And they asked the head of Barbarik, please tell us who is the real hero of the war. Was it Arjun or was it Bhima? Barbarik said, according to me, none of you all did anything. I saw Krishna Sudarshan Chakra travel around the battlefield and kill everyone. According to me, none of you all did anything. Barbarik teaches us a very important factor behind our success. I call this as the X factor behind our success. The Bhagavad Gita 
talks about five factors that influence any action. Whatever you do in your life, these are five factors that influence your action. What do you do? The first factor is called karta or the person. Any project you want to do, you choose the best person for the project, you will get the best results. The second factor Krishna speaks about is place. The place has a very powerful influence on the result. Like if India-Pakistan match happens in India, greater chance India will win, you know. Because the place has a great influence, isn't it? So, um, so you, should, you, you can choose the best person, you can choose the best place. The third factor that influences success is instruments. You choose the best quality instruments, you will get the best results. If you have inferior instruments, you will get inferior results, right? So choosing the instruments is very important, you know, what you use for doing things. The fourth factor is types of efforts. The more effort you put in, the greater chance you will get success. So Krishna says, these four factors are in your hand. You can choose the best person, choose the best place, the best instruments and the best type of efforts. This is in your hand. But there is one factor that is not in your hand. This is the fifth factor behind your success. And Krishna calls it as Daiva. Daiva means hand of destiny, hand of God, or you can call it luck. Whatever you want to call it, you can call it. But there is one factor that is beyond you. 